Redeemer the Summit family to our next installment of our survey of the book of Ecclesiastes. I hope that this finds you well and that you're enjoying uh, this Lord's Day. Um, it is a joy to get to open the Word of God before you again today, um, and I invite you to turn with me now uh, to the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, if you remember, uh, we started this survey two weeks ago, um, and I mentioned that this is more a thematic study of the book. It's not going to be an exegetical um, study as uh, we normally would do, um, but um, I'm following through uh, the Knowing the Bible series on the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, they've done most of the books of the Bible. Uh, I commend these to you if you ever want a good 12-week um, overview of a book of the Bible. Uh, these are fantastic. Um, I've done this series. Um, I've done the book of James. Um, and think they just do a really good job of giving you a big picture. And uh, that's where we're going to find ourselves today. Um, in fact, today, uh, if you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes uh, 1, uh, verse 12, and we're going to read all the way through chapter 2, verse 26. And so the latter uh, part of verse or chapter 1, and then all of chapter 2, what we're going to find is that the preacher, um, the writer of Ecclesiastes, is going to give us three vanities. Um, last week we talked about uh, this idea of vanity or um, striving or, um, you know, just, just this urge to pursue that bullet will not last. Well, this week uh, we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at three particular vanities um, and in doing so, uh, we're going to once again come to the conclusion uh, that um, striving after this world um, is meaningless um, unless it's a striving done um, in and through God. And so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, wisdom, uh, we're going to be talking about pleasure, and we're going to be talking about labor as the preacher outlines it for us. But before we do that, uh, let me uh, pray for us, and then we'll jump into the text. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you grateful for another day. We thank you for your provision over us. Lord, I, I thank you for this church body and their willingness to serve you. Lord, I, I have been um, humbled uh, by their continued effort um, to seek you, to uh, support your ministry both here and around the world um, and to participate in uh, endless um, online meetings over uh, what's almost been two months. And Lord, I do pray that uh, in this time of reflection that you have blessed us with, uh, that we would consider the merits of this world and pursuing it, that we would use that then to turn our attention and our focus to you as we remember the family and as we remember uh, what truly is important. Father, I continue to pray for those that have been affected by this virus, uh, whether it's physically or economically or emotionally. Um, Lord, I pray for a swift end to it, and I pray that you would bring all things um, anew. Ultimately, we pray for your return, in which you rid this world of sin and suffering um, and death itself. Um, Lord, until then, uh, walk close beside us and with us, um, as we seek you in all things. And we ask all this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So like I said, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 1, starting in verse 12. And then we're going to read all the way through to the end of chapter 2. This is a bit of an extended section, uh, but I do want to read the text. Uh, and then um, we, we will take a deeper look at it. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And applied my heart to seek and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. 
I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Chapter 2 I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this is also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works, I built houses, and I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, and planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all of my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil that I had expected in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness, and yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I become so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How wise dies just like the fool, so I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all which I have toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity." So I turned about me and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him who can eat and, or who can have enjoyment. For to the one who pleases him God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This is also vanity and striving after wind. Thus ends the reading of God's word. You know, the preacher now kind of details his quest, at least in this section um, in one thirteen, to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. And he goes into this long discussion about the fact that if it could be obtained, he obtained it. Uh, if it could have been gathered, if it could have been purchased, if it could have been enjoyed, he did. And this leads further credence to uh, the idea that this is King Solomon. Um, one of the, the wisest and, uh, and furthest reaching kings as far as influence, um, you know, rivaling his, his own father um, in that regard. But what you also see in that, and, and what we'll talk about today, is that all of it was available, and all of it was consumed, and all of it was enjoyed, and yet, again and again, the preacher says, this is vanity. Um, this is meaninglessness. This is worthless. This is pointless, ultimately. Because 
the preacher and the preacher is wise and, and we want to we want to make sure to remember that note um he knows that what crooked cannot be made straight um he's indulged and yet he's found that it, it never fixes the problem. It never gets to conclusion. It never gets to solution. And ultimately, what we should take away with this is, is what we've been saying uh, thus far is that um, we should see the vanity of life, uh, but we don't want to see that by itself. That in and of itself should drive us, should push us toward God where there is meaning and there is purpose and there is joy and there is fulfillment uh, that can't be found without. And this chapter is going to be more on the without God, um, but please don't forget that that's always the intent of this book is to push us from the despair and the doom and gloom, uh, the kind of Eeyore state, um, to that of um, but in God or through God or with God. So. Let's um, look at this um, in the three sections, uh, if you will, and I don't know why I closed my book. But um, the first section, uh, we talk about the vanity of wisdom. And um, attributing this again to Solomon, um, if he is the author, he would be the perfect one to speak on wisdom. But you might say, and I can almost hear you saying, well, wait a minute, isn't wisdom a good thing? How can that be a vanity? And that's the, that's important because that's really the point, isn't it? Um, you know, the, the preacher in 12 through 18 really says, you know, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done. It is an unhappy business that God has given the children of man. I have seen everything done under the sun. All is vanity. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I have acquired great wisdom, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, but this is also striving wind, for in much wisdom is much vexation. He who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I don't think that the preacher is saying here that wisdom is bad. Um, we know that uh, wisdom is one way to describe God, wisdom or knowledge. Um, is a way to describe God. The Proverbs uh, do this very well. But um, I think what the preacher is saying here is that the more wisdom you have, the more you know, especially in a theological sense, uh, the more aware you are of sin and the sinfulness of man and your own broken nature, I think it does grieve us more. I think it does make us more aware at just how awful we really are. Um, and in that sense, I think wisdom is vanity in that um, the further we go down that road, uh, the more meaninglessness we realize in our own selves. That's not that the wisdom is bad, but the wisdom is kind of the catalyst that reveals that to us. Um, you know, and the, the preacher is going to seek in the section to examine all that is in heaven um, or under heaven, what has been given to man. Um, and he says it's like striving after wind. Um, you know, I am, um, I don't know if cursed is the right word, but I have a great desire uh, for continuing education. I'm always looking for opportunities to learn more, to grow more, to uh, seek more knowledge. Um, and that can be a good thing, and, and I just I have to check myself because while that can be a good thing, uh, I think sometimes I would rather learn um, new things than use, apply, contemplate, think about the things that I already do know. I'd rather learn new skills, new tools, than really hone the ones that I've already been given. Uh, and I think this is a little at play here too, and, and some of you may find yourself like that, where you would rather go do something else instead of the thing that you need to do. One of my seminary roommates, um, he had this fascinating way of getting work done um, when uh, a paper was due um, and he was going to dedicate some time to it. He would first do five other assignments, uh, assignments that weren't um, the one that he needed to get done. And his rationale was, I have to get that one done. If I go ahead and do these, 
then they'll get done, and then I'm going to have to do the other, and then they all get done. It was a really interesting uh, philosophical way of doing things, uh, but Dave uh, worked for him. And, um, and I think in a little, um, I tried it, but it didn't work for me uh, because I found the ones that I didn't have to do more interesting than the one that I did. And, and there's some wisdom in that, and there's some, you know, what the preacher is saying here. I, I think that um, this is a lot of that, is we just seek the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Uh, but um, wisdom is not the only thing that the preacher warns us about here and the vanity of it. Um, he also speaks to the vanity of self-indulgence and living wisely. And this is the second uh, shift. He does this in chapter 2 uh, in those first 17 verses. And, and here is really when he opens up and, and says, you know, I looked for laughter, I found it. I looked for my heart, I looked for wine, I um, looked for folly, I made great works, I had houses, I had vineyards, I had gardens, I had parks, I had trees, I had pools, I had slaves, I had slaves that bore slaves, I had possessions, I had flocks, I had silver, I had gold, singers, concubines. I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And so he, he says and he admits that um, he had taken everything that he could have uh, to enjoy, and yet he comes to the same conclusion that it is vanity. Um, he got everything he desired, um, and this is good for us to think about. This is a good um, message for us today. Um, it's okay to want things, and it's okay to, to pursue that next thing, and to, to have goals, and to have dreams, and to have things you find joy in. Um, but uh, anything to excess, anything to um, please oneself is sinful. And that's a biblical message that we see all throughout Scripture. Uh, that's a, a reminder uh, that we have to be very careful of. Um, Self-indulgence. And sadly, that's the American way. That's the American dream. Um, please yourself. Um, take care of yourself. Watch out for number one. Um, I think of the Toby Keith song. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about the number one. Oh, my, me, my. What I know, what I like, what I think, what I want, what I see. Um, a popular country song that really speaks to where we're at as a society and where we're at as a culture. And the preacher succeeded in that, probably greater than any of us ever could. Um, he's saying, I did it. I accomplished it. I was able to, to have it if I wanted it. And yet it was all vanity, striving after the wind. It was not um, good. I became great and I surpassed all. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Then I considered all that my hands had done and all the toil that I had expended. And behold, it was all vanity. He also talks about this vanity of living wisely um, in this same thing um, you know in this kind of introspective well you know I even had wisdom I even sought um, to do the right things and I found folly in that as well I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly and he you know um, makes this interesting point the wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness, and yet I perceive the same thing happens to all of them. What happens to the fool will happen to the wise. Why then have I been so wise? And there's this reality that sets in on the preacher that ultimately death will find us all, that we will all um, face a point where we will die and where our life will end. And you can spend so much time seeking knowledge, seeking the next thing, preparing that you miss living in the here and in the now. You get so focused on what's ahead that you miss what you're currently going through. This is something um, that hits home very hard for me. I knew uh, from a young age, from my teenage years, that I wanted to go into ministry. I felt God's calling on me in that, and I pursued that. 
Um, and my undergrad, my undergrad, um, I switched from engineering to communications uh, so that I would have more public speaking classes because that would prepare me for ministry. And I knew, you know, get through this step and then I can go through school and then I'll find a good seminary and then you get through that step and then I'll find a good church and then you get through that step and then I will look for ordination and then you'll get through that step and then I will have it and then there I will be and you know I look back and think boy I missed a lot of opportunity in college I missed a lot of opportunity in seminary I missed a lot of things going on day to day because my mind was so focused on that date on that time where I would be ordained and where I would be considered a, a full-time minister and where I would have it all <laughs> yet I, I will tell you um, November will mark three years of ordained ministry if God wills it and um, you know my life hasn't really changed that much um, in fact, I think that uh, the busyness over the last two years, two and a half years, um, combined with the quarantine, really has had me slow down and go, wow, God has been providing every single day. And yet, a lot of the time, I've missed that day because I was focused on the next and the next and the next. And we have to be careful of that, um, for we are prone to that. One last uh, vanity he gives, though, is the vanity of toil and he tells this fascinating story here where he's done all this great work and he's done all these great things and his fear is he will have to pass that on to somebody else who doesn't appreciate it who doesn't put in the work who doesn't put in the labor who doesn't put in the effort um, and that's particularly interesting with Israel and with the promised land isn't it because they came into vineyards already producing they came and found the honeycomb and the honey, well, it takes time for bees to make that. It takes time for vines to produce. It takes time for houses to be built. It takes time for wells to be dug. And that, in fact, was God's promise. I will bring you into a land where all of that is done for you and that all of that is provided. And yet, that's the preacher's fear. I will do all of this and it's going to go away. I'm going to die and someone else is going to take it and they may or may not care for it. They may or may not love it like I did. They may or may not treat it properly. This is vanity. Putting things ahead, building things that may not last, that may not stand. And I, I think that this one too is a, a, a danger in our lives to the point that the preacher says he hates his toil. And so what we need to remember is, as we talk about some theological applications is the only escape for the circle, the only escape for what he's talking about is God, is seeking God, is pursuing God, is looking forward to God, is working toward godly lives because everything else will go away, fade away, will end. And so as we think about uh, some gospel glimpses where this uh, peeks in for us, um, we, we remind ourselves of a couple of things. One, the lasting significance of the earth and humanity's temporal nature in comparison. We may desire to have lasting significance, but we can't obtain it. We may seek to do things that will matter, but our efforts are failed attempts. We cannot catch the wind. We cannot achieve the lasting significance of the sun. Instead, we labor under it. And Ecclesiastes was written in order for us to despair in ourselves and depend on our joyous God. Anything other than that is an attempt to grasp that which is unobtainable. Um, we, we find this other places in Scripture. Mark 8, for example, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit or lose his soul? Far better to seek God and give reward there than to have everything in this world and ultimately be empty, as the preacher is talking here. And the, the king 
and his self-indulgence is another gospel glimpse we have because this is the natural inclination of the human heart when left unchecked. Jesus gives self-denial. Jesus gives love. Jesus gives sacrifice, the true king. I mean, even on the cross, he was willing to forgive those that were nailing him to it. The preacher, however, didn't check himself. He didn't slow down. He didn't contemplate what he was doing. He just consumed. Jesus emptied himself. This is what a king is supposed to look like. This is how a king is supposed to serve. This is how a king is supposed to live over his people. And then the, the last kind of gospel glimpse is, is this idea that in this fallen world, many are weighed down with anxiety, fear, and trouble. The preacher says, all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This is vanity. The way to fight anxiety is not to forget our problems or increase our self-confidence. Freedom from fear comes through hoping in God and God's promises. That's how you solve the problem. And we see these big Bible pictures. This idea of toil, um, well, we could get that in the garden. This idea of work, hard work. Um, this idea that um, we should seek God because there's not pleasure, true pleasure, in the, the fading things of this world. Um, really, what I think that we should see in this and these three vanities is Christ. Because whether it's the vanity of wisdom, well, Christ took his wisdom and there was no counter. There was no sin to realize. And, and as Christ grew in wisdom, he grew in his, his knowledge and his ability to fulfill his own will, God's will. As Christ saw pleasure and um, satisfaction in his work, he did so knowing that he was preaching and teaching and proclaiming the good news that would save the lost. It wasn't for himself. Well, it was for himself, but it was uh, more so for his brothers and sisters. And then labor and work. Um, I believe that Christ did enjoy his work. I did. I do believe that Christ took his job seriously and did it well. Um, because if Christ was told something by God, the Father, he did carry it out and he would carry it out. And we, we think about that love. We, we think about that connection. We, we think about that beautiful relationship. And it was not vanity. And it is not vanity. And so as we consider our own lives, as we consider um, who we are, then we would do well to consider these things and to really search ourselves and ask, what are we holding up? What are we after? What are we pursuing in this life? And if it's not God, take it from the preacher, it will ultimately not satisfy.